Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome everybody tonight to this special IES meeting um, to look primarily at the uh, the rural zone, but we have some other items as well. Uh, I'd like to start the evening, the meeting tonight, with the statement of acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge this land we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect the spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the greater Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. Um, I'd also like to just quickly make, um, uh, read out a, a quick statement regarding the sad passing of, our, of the Queen. So I just wish to acknowledge the sad passing of our sovereign Queen Elizabeth II and also uh, to acknowledge the dedication of her service of over 70 years to the realm. Um, I also like to congratulate uh, King uh, Charles III and uh, wish him all the best in his ongoing, as stated, uh, dedication to the realm. So it's a sad time for, um, for the country and for the Commonwealth. Thank you. Uh, now I've got a roll call tonight. Have we got any apologies? I think we have got one apology. I think from Council Little. Yep. Anyone else is here? Um, we got that? Got Council Little as the. No, oh, we'll just move. Keep moving. Yep. Um, now the next item is public open forum. So tonight we're at, we're listening to representations from people that made submissions and also from people that didn't make submissions. Um, we've, I've got a list in front of me of those people. Are this, is there anybody else in the um, in the gallery tonight that would like to speak that hasn't notified? Okay, that's fine. Uh, so tonight we've, we will be, we'll be looking at that, that item. We've also got two other items on tonight, which is the miscellaneous technical amendment, because that's something we'll look at, and also um, commenting on 306 Twaits roads. So that's, that's another part of the agenda tonight. So there's three agenda items, but I think most people are, are interested in the first one is the land capacity assessment. Uh, where were we going to go? We've done that, we've done that, we've done that. No apologies. Any motions to grant leave of absence? No leave of absence, non attendance. So we've done that. Any any declarations of interest? Councillor Bay Longwood, do you want to state your what it is? I have land in that area. Uh, but I'll be staying in the meeting. So you'll deal with it by staying in the meeting? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. And what's your conflict? Is it a perceived? Oh, wait, this press button, try it again so people know. Perceived. Per perceived conflict. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Oh, let's move on to. Let's move on to the um, to the presentations. And I've got Mr. Jim Kelly here to give a presentation, an overview of his report. So, Jim, do you want to come to the podium and provide a presentation? Here we go. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank the council for the opportunity to do this work on behalf of the council and the wider community of Gawler. Um, just click on the thing on the bottom. Look, um, the discussion we found was very binary, you know, it, um, 
the land the land parcels were small and the um, it was a discussion around the value of the land and could you know horticulture be carried out there viably. Uh, we looked at um, you know sort of triple bottom line, what might be the social, economic, and environmental benefits of uh, maintaining a horticultural zone in the land that we discussed. Next slide, if you like. Uh, we reviewed all of the past reports that have been done um, in the greater northern Adelaide region with respect to horticulture. And uh, we just listed those, uh, those reports here. And the reports were both encouraging and discouraging. So yep. what we found out was when we plotted the land size uh, versus the number, of, uh, the number of properties, we found that um, 90%, I can't read up there, 90% of the land sizes were less than five hectares. So it was really significant, 69% were less than um, um, three hectares. And this made it a little problematic. It was, you know, it's that size, the amount of land that you need to get an economic outcome. Uh, next slide. And this is just looking at the crops. So what we did was we took a, a, a land area of five hectares or less, and then we looked at uh, national gross margins. And we found that there were a range of crops that you could make uh, reasonable returns out of gourmet tomatoes, uh, capsicums, cauliflowers. Mostly they were the greenhouse, the, um, the intensive type production systems. And we did look at a couple of unusual native vegetables, which would have been able to um, be grown in a greenhouse and produce really good returns. But they are the sort of returns that you can get per hectare on a gross margin. So a gross margin for those who don't understand is that you would own your tractor, you would own your infrastructure, it's what you make out of it after you own all of that infrastructure, right? So it's looking at your um, uh, uh, gross returns minus your, your uh, uh, operational costs out of it. It doesn't have depreciation in it, right? So basically we, we got down to field crops were just not viable on that area. Perennial horticulture, mm, marginally annual horticulture. So it really came down to the intensive the more intensive uh, operations. As we said, olives and vines here, you might be able to get an income that's supplementary income on a property, but it was those, um, it's those intensive horticultural crops that could be grown in greenhouses. But in saying all of that, there was one limiting factor and we move on. So the main limiting factor is water supply. If you don't have a, a, a supply of water, then um, intensive horticulture is very difficult to maintain. So in, there needs to be a discussion around source of water, cost of water, competing demands for water. At the moment, there's a, a big push to take more water to the Brossa Valley from this region. Um, confirming the zone for water, water, sorry, perennial or annual horticulture. Um, probably the biggest asset that you've got in this region is proximity to market and proximity to transport routes. But you know, there are gonna need to be more transport. So the, the main arterial roads are good, but there would need to be more roads put into the region if it was going to be um, developed up as a horticultural region to take the weight of trucks and, and equipment that needs to go. And noise is always an issue. So once you get into that peri-urban interface, there is a real issue around noise. Conclusion, water supply is currently the major limitation. So without water, it's, uh, the discussion becomes more academic. So reliability, quality, affordability of water, an opportunity exists for the town of Gawler, Gawler to secure water from the Brossa New Water Project. Um, it, it's a discussion that needs to be had, you know, so, and the water quality, it may open up more opportunities because there's a discussion being held, had with, um, uh, PERSA and um, SA water at the moment about desalinating that water, which, which allows it to bring in a different range of crops that, uh, that could be grown in the region. So perennial and annual horticulture are, are viable on the basis of gross margin analysis, but it would require securing new water sources. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, is there any questions from councillors for Mr. Kelly? Any questions at all? 
Okay, thank you. That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. Now I've got an order of um, of speakers. We've got um, Mr. So these are the people that put in submissions and requested to speak. So it's Mr. Graham Brookman, uh, Andrea Burke, Dominic Cavallaro, Mr. Grazio Mariallo, I've got that right, from UPRS, Mr. Tony Piccolo and Mr. Adrian Shackley. And then we have two who have sought to have a submission tonight who didn't put in a submission and that's uh, Matt Laurie Hunter and Mr. Ian Tooley. Uh, for each person about five, about five minutes, you can limit it to five minutes. And um, just to make it easier, I will take questions after people speak, but I don't want it to turn into a, another, another five minutes of going on again. But I'd like people just to be succinct in answering the questions that uh, councillors might ask. So, um, and I'll give you a 30 second um, warning, I suppose, when you're getting close to five minutes, four and a half minutes. Uh, okay, Mr. Graham Brookman, you're up first, thank you. I'm on. I'm You're on. on. Um, thanks very much for um, allowing me five minutes or thereabouts. Um, and I guess uh, just um, thinking about Jim's points, uh, there are an awful lot of people who do own land who are not looking to earn a full income for their family. Uh, and, and that includes actually a fairly large percentage of farmers in South Australia. So if you look at, you know, even people out in the, the mid north and so forth, a lot of them are really riding pretty heavily on the income from uh, one of the family members who may be a teacher or uh, a nurse or what, whatever. So I think to sort of expect um, a, a piece of land to necessarily earn a full income for a family is actually a bit unrealistic as uh, an expectation. Um, but I did um, just zip down my road, Hillier Road uh, today and had a chat to a few of the farmers there uh, because a lot of people have been saying there aren't, aren't any proper farmers uh, around Gawler. And uh, so we have Knight, Knight's Roses, which is one of South Australia's largest nurseries employing 60 staff and using water from the T1 aquifer. Um, a, a major local agricultural contractor involved with dryland agriculture management in Hillier, including field crops and sheep production. Um, Briarwood Farms Nursery, one of South Australia's significant ornamental plant nurseries employing 15 people and principally running the business on board water from the T2 aquifer. Um, my own place, not that I've got, got a big barrow to push, uh, we're the largest growers of certified organic pistachios in Australia. Uh, we also grow sheep, fruit and veg, uh, and we uh, get our water from uh, a bore in the T1 and also some water from the river and uh, from stormwater. And just, uh, I guess, the main concerns of those real farmers, if you like, who I just happened to be almost next to were that they that in this sort of renovation of Adelaide, which is ha happening through the, um, uh, the, the state government, that, 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 it, that they get left with enough land to allow the area to, to, to work for rural pursuits. In other words, they, they don't want to have wall-to-wall uh, -wall traffic and lots of impediments to um, carrying out agricultural stuff. So they'd like to see a fair whack of the rural land um, saved from uh, urban subdivision and that sort of thing. But more importantly, they want certainty about the uh, ongoing rural character of the area. These are multi-generational families who've been farming for a, there for a long time uh, and they need to be able to grow and invest with confidence. Just thinking about some of the questions that the council consultation raised, um, so the, this is the central district. This, this was the absolute grain bowl of South Australia when the settlers came here and they're excellent soils and they are underlain by these big aquifers that are quite reliable uh, and uh, our area, the southern area of Gawler, 
lies over the top of them. Uh, you can't move the aquifers. Uh, you, you've got to use it uh, there. And uh, saying, well, let's move the water somewhere else is not, not necessarily a particularly feasible idea. So not only is it capable of uh, running these uh, larger properties, it's also, of course, quite suitable for really resilient rural living. Um, and so there are a lot of people who want to have just a few animals. They want to be able to grow their own vegetables and have a little orchard and so forth. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, that, that that's something that's a really a quite attractive idea. Uh, so uh, in terms of the uh, species that we could grow economically, if you, if you think, okay, we're going to grow this stuff and eat it ourselves instead of going to supermarket and buying it, uh, there's over a hundred uh, different varieties of food uh, which that area of land will support. Uh, the area was judged by Aris, by Jim Kelly's mob as demonstrating um, a, uh, a capacity for uh, a viable land use. Um, I, I would say that... Uh, 30 seconds, Grant. Yep, thanks very much. That the main thing really is um, we have an opportunity to ask the state government to declare the area between the hills and... Um, uh, the western boundary of Gawler um, uh, and, and EFPA, so changing the rural land to an uh, environmental and food production area, which would give long-term certainty. And I feel that we should uh, also look at um, putting the, the bulk of Cuddler uh, under the recommendations of Jensen 2, uh, a report that had a lot of good thinking in it, uh, such that we can have a viable rural living area. Okay. Oh, thank you, Graeme. Uh, no, any questions for Graeme Brookman? Katie? No. You turn yours off, Graeme. Sorry? You turn yours off. Oh, yeah, sorry. I... So, yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, so I guess just... Around the question of the water supply, since that was the main, I guess, thrust of the presentation earlier, is so you have a you have a, a workable water supply. Is that in part, I guess, because there aren't many major farmers in the area? Would you be more in trouble, I guess, if everyone here started running a major farming operation, or is this something that would still be self-sustainable uh, across the board? I guess. Thanks. Well, of course, in the last uh, month or so, we've seen a, a lot of water come down the river and it does that from time to time. And so we're in the business of actually recharging the aquifer. So we, because we have access to the river, we, we, we have an advantage, but we also you know, use the T1 as uh, a storage. Uh, and uh, obviously we've got um, an organisation that's... Uh, part of the government which looks after the aquifers such that they're not overused uh, and the T1 is in pretty good shape as is the T2 uh, and some of the bores in uh, Gawler's rural area absolutely excellent. Uh, others are not so lucky uh, but in a lot of these um, uh, smaller blocks such as uh, is suggested for Cuddler um, they would be uh, able to have a, a, a reasonable kind of landscape using mains water, um, depending on you know what they had in mind. Obviously, they wouldn't be going in for massive uh, greenhouses and so forth if they didn't get extra water. Now, hopefully, uh, we will get not only water here uh, from Bolivar, but water that's been desalinated to a certain extent, which is perfectly feasible. Uh, it's been done before, it can be done again. Um, and um, I think in this major review the government's uh, conducting at the moment that they ought to be having a, a bit of a think about um, places like Gawler. I mean, it's, this piece of land is, is really quite unique. And in, in Melbourne, they have uh, developed these green wedges, which actually where the, the yeah. agricultural land um, intrudes yeah. into the yeah. pri primary production in, in, into the, the city and it's been extremely successful. Do you, okay. any, any other questions?
So thanks, Karen. Any other questions for Mr. Bookman? Okay. Okay. Nathan. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Graham, for presenting tonight. Um, so just in your humble opinion, you um, listed off some other businesses that have made a go of it. You made a comment um, saying some of these um, farmers are, you know, generational. If you were to set up from scratch today, what sort of investment are we talking? Um, and then also, why hasn't it been done yet, in your opinion? Well, um, I mean, I don't know all the farmers in the area. Um, and so uh, I'm not, you know, I know those guys, uh, uh, but it's not like it's some kind of club or anything. Um, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, to, to, to get into mid-north farming, you'd be wanting to shell out, you know, 3 million or something like that. But if you were um, a recent arrival from, another country and you'd, you'd come out with uh, half a million and you set up a, a greenhouse, uh, there's, there's hundreds of people who have done that in Virginia. Um, so uh, some of them worked two or three jobs, but, but okay, they had a dream and they worked hard and they worked their way up and that's exactly what I think will, will happen. But if we have this land here that is subject to um, the whim of um, the, the council uh, or the developers through the environment court, uh, just suddenly changing something from rural to deferred <laughs> urban to, uh, to to to, to uh, a yeah, bingo, yeah, you've been subdivided. Yeah, 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 yeah great. We won't go into a, another. Yeah, I think you've answered. Um, have you answered? Is he answered the question, you Nathan? Yeah, I just, I just, I don't want to go into another <laughs> dissertation. That's all. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you, um, David. Oh, you got a question? Oh, sorry, Nathan. Have you had another one? Yep. Yeah. Please do that. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> so the, the main question was, um, why hasn't it happened yet? You rightfully <clears throat> touched on Virginia, um, but you could, if it's possible, do it in this area, but it hasn't happened. Am I on? Yep. Uh, well, well, clearly um, the uh, area has some farmers that are doing fine uh, and uh, clearly uh, there are areas where there's not good underground water or people are undercapitalised um, and uh, four hectares doesn't sound very much, but um, it, it, it is actually quite a big area to manage. And I, and I think that probably Cuddler has not flourished be, because it's essentially mainly dry land uh, and um, uh, they'd, they'd do a lot, lot better with smaller lots. And if we had certainty, we would get bigger farmers with bigger capital and they would make this work. I, I can guarantee that a, a lot of people have moved out because they've seen that Gawler just keeps on making exception after exception. Uh, and, and so we saw, you know, bits and pieces get uh, developed that really um, should have remained part of the, the green yep. belt. And so we need that surety. Thank, yeah, yeah, thanks, Graham. I don't want to go to again, that presentation. Is that, is that okay now for you, Nathan? You, yep, David, you had a question? I, yeah, just, I just want to clarify, if people could just keep their answers succinct, I don't want it to turn to another dissertation, please. Okay, <laughs> David. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, um, thanks, uh, Graham, for talking. Um, mine was about the the new arrivals because my understanding is there is some businesses that have set up shop on Hillier mm -hmm. Road and in Cuddler and and you know, recent arrivals that are making a go with flowers and, and vegetables, and that's that's been my uh, observations. That's what you were talking about earlier, wasn't it? I, I think it's um, very important that. Um, we, we enable people who uh, have a limited kind of resources to be able to commute to their land and the refugees and Burundians and so forth really have had um, massive problem getting enough land and there have been some good landowners who've allowed um, new arrivals to use part of their land such that they can, you know, get on with this 
self self sufficiency type operation, and and I, and I I think it's a very healthy thing for our community. Gaul has always been a very um, supportive community for refugees and and so forth. And uh, it, it's you know we can actually build a community here that has values other than money and other than megalitres of water. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Now, David, that is that okay? Real quick. Any other quick quick questions for Graham? Okay. Uh, no, no, no. Yep, question, yep. No, I'm sorry, it's, you, you, it's, it's not no, a discussion no, between no. people. Uh, it's, no. it's, a, it's, a, it's a meeting for councillors to get information. Thank you. Karen? Um, sorry, so, no, you can't speak, thank you. So I've got a question. You can speak later if you want to. Yep, yep, yep. I've got a question, Chair. So, um, Graham, you mentioned about an EFPA. Can you explain what that is? Thank you. You can't be a hip. Um, yes, uh, environment and food production areas, which are protected uh, at a state level, um, and uh, there, there, there shan't be uh, any. Uh, subdivision for urban uh, purposes in those areas and they occupy most of the north bank of the river so if you go down the Gawler River out to your right you've got light and that's mainly FPA land and if you go uh, down towards Adelaide on your left going up to the hills that is also but somehow Gawler got left out and there is this big gap between the biodiversity of the Adelaide Hills uh, and um, uh, the next council over, we've just suddenly got this hole there and that really could be uh, filled uh, and um, you would find that uh, the biodiversity that uh, can come up along the Gawler River, which has actually got a, a lot of biodiversity, can flow up and it, we would find also that this area can become a, a green wedge which uh, alleviates some of the heat problems that Gawler has been showing up on national heat maps. So there are a lot of reasons to actually have some more green between us and the, the rest of the city, quite apart from the esoteric kind of, we want an, uh, an entrance to Gawler and those sorts of issues, which are quite good planning issues, but we're probably more concerned with the, uh, uh, the employment and, and ag production stuff tonight, I guess. Yep, okay, thank, any, thank you, Grant. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next person to speak is Miss Andrea Burke. Andrea Burke, there you go. Yep, thank you. Beauty. Oh, I think you're right. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. All right, thanks, um, Mr. Chair. Look, I haven't really prepared anything tonight, but it's just more talking about from um, a landowner's perspective. Um, I've watched the area go through meeting after meeting after meeting about changes to zoning and developments and talking about the buffer zone and um, having horticulture around the area. I am for subdivision. Um, I'm definitely for that. Um, talking about the future and the way that the land and the infrastructure is coming down to Cudler, which is where I live, is coming down thick and fast. Um, and also from the Gawler side, it's also coming the other way th thick and fast. So I can't see why we should have to miss out from that perspective. I also understand from a horticultural perspective that some people may still want to farm and, and have that side. Um, just to give you a bit of an indication about me, I do have experience in the horticultural industry. I do deal with farmers on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I guess my comment would be, is that if it was more economically viable and they did see return on investment in that infrastructure, they'd already be there. We've already got major growers around other regions, especially Virginia, Two Wells, all that sort of area. They're there, they're doing it, and they're making lots of money. So I don't understand why they're not in Cudler. And the main reason is, is they don't have the water and the infrastructure. So if that's not gonna happen and nothing's gonna change, then it's not going to be viable. Um, I agree with Mr. Kelly's report. Um, I think that that summed it up pretty nicely with what he presented. From a council perspective, I haven't been to meetings before. I work full time. Um, 
I have a feeling and my voice is that I don't feel like the people are being heard. I think that um, lots of meetings have happened and I don't feel like that council have really heard the people that are living in the area. I don't, um, I think in terms of subdivision, it'd give us better streetscapes. We'd have better infrastructure. We'd be able to develop a, a more of a community mindset and have young families moving into the area. And there are young people moving into the area. So you're gonna have some different scopes of families coming in. I don't own a huge amount of land, but I do own land. Um, and if I wanna grow some veggies or whatever on the side, I'm, I'm happy to do so. Could I make an income out of it? Absolutely not. Um, and at the end of the day, I think if you give people the option, I don't know if you can balance it somehow, um, but if you want, if people want to be able to subdivide, they should be able to subdivide. And that should still be an option. And the other thing I just wanted to bring up is um, just around sustainability. And I don't understand much around the water aquifers under the ground, but I do know that at the moment, sustainability is becoming more and more prevalent in today's society. And at the moment we are consuming one and a half earth resources every year. So at the moment, we are over consuming the amount of resources we have. So unless we change, and unless we actually make a conscious decision, it's just going to keep going. So if we started to put farming land in, and we started to consume more and more of that water, well, we're just going to speed up that process. That's it for me. Well, thank you. Um, any questions? In this group? Oh, Nathan? Yep. Ah, thank you um, for presenting. I know it can be intimidating for your first time, so you did really well. Um, look, so I'm just um, trying to get my head around what you define um, subdivision. You have a X size block. What's your definition of subdivision? Sometimes um, the lines get a bit muddied and sometimes I think um, 300 square metres is what people expect when we talk about subdivision. What's your view on that? So my view on that, um, as I said, I'm not a massive landholder. I've only got three acres, right? So I'm probably on the lower end of the scale. I'm probably down to where we can subdivide. It's two and a half acres currently, right? Is the minimum that we can subdivide to. I don't think Lego land is probably where everyone wants to go. And I'll call it Lego land because that would be 300 square metre subdivision. Um, but I'm certainly not opposed to 1,000 square metre blocks, 1,500 square metre blocks, um, I think that would still work very nicely. It's going to be bigger than what a lot of the other subdivisions around us are and still give, I guess, a nice sort of area for people to be able to manage if they wanted to. Thank you. Nathan, is that okay? That's, yep. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, next up is Mr. Dominic Cavallaro. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, uh, and the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, I'm located on, uh, uh, at Hillier on Anglebar Road, and uh, I've got a background in, as an agronomist, and I've worked 30 years in the Northern Adelaide Plains working with growers. Um, I think the report that has been put together by um, uh, Jim Kelly and team, uh, certainly from a soil suitability assessment, is a very a detailed report and, uh, and, and covers those areas quite well. My concern with the report is uh, the economic side of things and um, uh, some of the uh, uh, figures that have been uh, discussed in, the, in that report. Uh, I know they're working on gross margins, but um, uh, you know the suitability, and I think for this area, suitability of greenhouses are, uh, are ones that can provide um, an economic benefit for the participants, and there are some successes in that area. But also, area, area, there are some greenhouses, like on Dowkeith Road, that are not successful. Um, and um, the skill level that's required for growing greenhouses, especially with supermarket requirements, um, in, integrated pest management, those resources are there, but the skill level of the grower needs to be able to utilise those skills and implement them uh, in their greenhouses. Um, and certainly at the current prices, the greenhouse growers are getting are very high, but there's a ratio I use, it's a one in 10 year ratio. They get one year at very high prices 
and they've got to survive on that for the next nine to 10 years. And there are times when only two or three years ago, growers were not even picking eggplants or the capsicums because they weren't, weren't uh, viable. So I think we need to be very careful in the economics and the economics when we're looking at either uh, feeding a family or just a way of life, you're going to be wanting to grow something so it covers the costs. And, um, and certainly um, uh, issues like availability of water. And it's not just availability of water, but also the infrastructure costs. So for example, a bore uh, is in the order of about $60,000. And to get a license into the area, if it's permitted, you're looking at around uh, uh, another forty dollars to $60,000. So already before you even start, there's a $120,000 investment just for using a bore. Uh, a lot of the recycled schemes are at cost. And so you, you pay towards the infrastructure costs um, and that can make it difficult for small landholders. My family are involved with almond growing and I just want to pinpoint some of the discrepancies within that report. Um, the gross margins were from 2010 um, and they use a yield of 3.2 tonne per hectare. We've never been able to get 3.2 tonne per hectare in this region. Because of our climate and our uh, uh, rainfall and temperatures, we are in the order of two to 2.5 tonne per hectare. So the other thing too, within that report, and, and Jim might be aware of it, the 10 hectare and the 20 hectare are incorrect as far as yields. It's just a mathematical um, mistake, but it does skew the data. And so unless we're actually using data that's relevant to this area, then as council, as you're looking at that report and think, well, okay, almonds are viable. When, you know, sourcing primary information is very important. And a question to the almond board would have clarified the yields that are achieving in this area so that we actually have real data and not uh, data that's in, in other areas not related to uh, this area. So at, when we look at prices on produce, it's not unusual for it to be the same as over a number of years. And for almonds, for example, uh, it's quoted as $5.5 per uh, uh, kilo. Um, in, at the moment, growers are getting six, but when we look at the cost of production, have gone up significantly. The prices of uh, fuel, fertilizer, labor costs have gone up significantly. And at that lower end of the sort of five to 10 hectare mark, you'd be lucky to break even. So I think it's really important that when we're looking at the sustainability uh, and whether we can actually do anything, you're not gonna grow something or turn your area into horticulture if you're gonna be uh, uh, not making money and, uh, and it's going, actually going to cost you, whether it's a way of life or not. So I think from my point of view- 30 seconds, thanks, Mr. Cavallaro. Thank I think that what's lacking uh, in the report, it talks about water, but the cost of water infrastructure is very significant. Returns on investment are very important and sensitivity to price changes will show as councillors that just a slight change means that it's a negative return, whether you're doing it for a way of life or whether you're doing it for profitability. And also the scales of economy. Don't take for granted the infrastructure costs that you need, tractors, machinery, um, and contractors. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions from councillors? No questions? Thank you. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Grazio Mariano. Mariano? Mariano, yes, Grazio. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm from URPS, where, as you most of you will know, our town is a town planning firm. We're acting on behalf of the owner at Lot 70, 71 Coventry Road, Cuddler. Um, now, thank you for, for the opportunity to provide feedback on the draft through areas, land can we a assessment report. We do appreciate council's willingness to consult on the draft report and hear representations from its community. With respect to our, our client's land, that allotment has an area of approximately 30 hectares and is bounded by Coventry Road to the west, the railway, the rail line to the east and Gordon Road to the south. His land or their land, I'd like to see the, um, the vine development, residential development further, further north. This development, as you would appreciate, is progressing well and rapidly. 
residential land division applications have already been lodged down to Gordon Road. So our client's land is essentially a butting a developing residential estate. Renewal SA owns land abutting the residential development. This land is largely zoned for, for residential purposes, but along the main North Road frontage, there is some land zoned open space. The issue um, came, or the question came up earlier on about the environmental, the environment and food and food production area. I would suggest that well, this land is not in the state's environment and food production area. And, and with respect, I would suggest that it wasn't an oversight that the land's not within the area. I would suggest that the state holds a view that considering the broader region, this, this site, this land isn't considered by the state to be of significant food um, production value within the region. Otherwise, the land could have been included in the environmental food production area. Our client is also an experienced wheat farming family and has, has first-hand knowledge of the challenges associated and costs required to manage cropping land. Our client tells us that wheat farming is only productive on very large broad acre um, sites, not his 30 um, hectare site. As you, would have, as you would have heard, farmers are dealing with challenges associated with high, high costs, um, with machinery, fuel, and fertilizers, making small scale farming unviable. In, in the last year alone, the cost of fertilizers from our client's perspective have increased from 330 to $1,200 a ton. For the reasons outlined in our submission, and I'll keep my submission to, to, five, me, to five, five minutes, we contend that our client's land is not suitable for viable primary production and should be utilized to support an environmentally sustainable and affordable high quality residential development, similar to the Northern site. Such development would result in significantly more tree cover and other environmental benefits than currently exists on that land. Further, the development potentially could be associated with infrastructure agreements and there could be financial contributions to broader social and environmental, environmental benefits. This land represents a logical extension to the existing residential zone land to the north and to the northeast. Regarding um, the broader comments in the Rural Areas Land Capability Report, there, there are several comments of, of interest. And if we interpret the report correctly, um, well, we, well, we highlight the following. Our understanding of the report is that it identifies that most primary production in the rural zone is financially difficult to make viable if you don't have affordable water. Affordable water is the, is the key here in some respects. Any concept of primary, of primary production becoming economically viable in the area appears to be based on the notion that available, affordable, quality water will, will be at your present. We, we believe this is highly, highly speculative. We, we are not convinced that this is achievable. Even if, we, even if recycled water was made available, the issue, of, seconds, thanks, Grant, uh, the issue of salt levels mm -hmm. uh, needs need to be addressed. The report also appears to suggest that, that, that final land suitability will depend on the risk of a landholder is prepared to absorb a specific non-typical horticultural produce, such as bush tomatoes or higher cost greenhouse production. We have little confidence based on the conversations we've had that most rural living landowners have the, have the risk profile to accept such financial risks. I've got a page left. Hopefully you don't mind me speaking for another minute. Uh, okay, yeah, keep going. And very kind. Of there is no discussion in the report regarding the practicality of farming associated with residential interface issues. Operating a farm in proximity to, to residential development is difficult due to the challenge associated with impacts on amenity through spray drift, noise, out operation. Map uh, figure three in our submission, in our written submission, highlights that much of the land is already used for rural living residential purposes. Although there are some small farms around, a lot of the land based on um, the state government data suggests that the land is already um, gone for, for residential development. It is extremely difficult 
to get that land back into productive horticulture development. Rarely happens. Small fragmented primary production land is generally unviable for most people. Not for all, but, but for most people. Further, Thanks, Gus, you want to respond to that now, please? Two paragraphs. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for your patience. Further yes. rural living lots generally command higher land values than horticultural land, which makes it difficult to, to establish horticultural uses or for existing farmers to buy um, rural, rural living land. Although there are some farms in the area, in many respects, the horse has already bolted in this area. Um, it's extremely unlikely land, in our opinion, will be converted back to horticulture for the reasons we've, we've heard. Um, changes to the planning policies are required to promote certain certainty in investment decisions and achieve better quality environmental and active community outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Grazia. Uh, any questions? Oh, thank you. Okay, no questions. Thank you. Uh, next is Mr. Tony Piccolo, member for Light. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and councillors, for the opportunity to address you tonight on this important issue. And I just, uh, even though I live in the area, uh, I am here tonight as a representative of the local community and not speaking in, in terms of a landowner. And what I'm about to say tonight builds on builds upon the letter I addressed to council on the 1st of July, uh, uh, 1st of July this year, which was in response to a community meeting, which I sponsored a bit earlier uh, during June. Uh, members of council, I, I, I'm like many other people in this room tonight. Um, I don't have the te technical expertise to comment on this report, which is before you. Um, I, I don't have that background, uh, but I, what I am in, in a position to talk about though, is the process the council have gone through in terms of this report and the issue generally, and also the views of the landowners living in the Southern rural areas of Gawler. I am capable of dealing with those two matters. From my point of view, the report seeks to determine uh, on what is ideal for this land. But there is an underlying assumption, I think, that primary production is the preferred site and the report sought to find reasons and ways of maintaining a primary production zoning for the area. Assuming, even assuming that the, uh, assuming the capability assessment is correct, it talks about basically one option and that's intensive primary production or what I'd call culture. Even if you were to accept that was a possibility, visually, it would actually impair the area, not improve the area. Having acres and acres of greenhouses doesn't give you trees and tree coverage, et cetera. It just gives you a lot of buildings and outbuildings, et cetera. Um, and there's some example of that already in some parts of the area. And so if that's what you're looking as sort of an outcome, a visual outcome, I'd certainly ask you to consult with your residents what that's what they want in terms of visual outcome for that locality, because that's the reality of intensive horticulture. It's greenhouses, it's buildings, and there's outbuildings for sheds, et cetera, et cetera. And the actual amount of tree coverage in those allotments, which do have, have intensive horticulture at the moment, is next to zero. So if it's the aim of the council to green the area, that's not gonna work. I don't think it's gonna work. Then you look at the water issues, which the consultant has already indicated is a major issue for that area if you wanted to even to maintain the primary production. The water issue, I don't believe can be resolved in any short to medium term. The fact that water hasn't been extended northwards uh, with a nice scheme because it's sheer cost to landowners who have broader acres to deal with in the Virginia Two Wells area speaks for itself. And now they're trying to sell it to the Barossa, where you, have, which, where you do have high yielding crops, like vines, et cetera. Even that is marginal at best. In terms of the process, this is a very technical report. And um, my understanding is that, is that the note went out to some landowners in the area uh, asking for feedback. 
And given the technical nature of the report, like many other people like myself, probably weren't in a position to actually provide feedback on the technical nature of that report. There was no information session held up front before the closure of uh, asking people for comment. That would have been very helpful to have that sort of overview tonight, a few months ago, rather than tonight, so people actually had some idea what the assumptions were from the report. Um, so one has to question how legitimate this whole consultation process with the residents has been. So what are the residents and landowners in this area seeking? As mentioned earlier, they actually are seeking to be heard. It says, this matter has been going on for years, and it seems that when council commissions a whole series of reports, the ones it likes, it puts out for public comment. Even the independent reports council has done, which it doesn't like, either tries to keep them confidential from, from the community, or doesn't actually allow for any community cons consultation. I don't recall, you know, the community being given an opportunity to address the Jensen report in this chamber. So what is it? Uh, another thing is that- 30 seconds, thanks, Tony. Thank you. The other concern is that the, the, the residents believe that the experience of living here uh, for decades has been overlooked. And uh, overwhelmingly, people do not, do not believe, based on the experience, that primary production is available. It's acknowledged that there's not universe, unanimous agreement what needs to replace the primary production zoning. However, a range of lifestyle options do exist. And they are mentioned in the Jensen report. In my view, the Jensen report is a good starting point to negotiate with the community to achieve an outcome uh, which meets the interests of the, of the landowners in the area, but also the community at large. Uh, and for this reason, just one more yes. for this reason, Mr. Chairman, um, people who live in this area do not believe that council could undertake a fair and reasonable code amendment and would, would prefer the minister undertake a code amendment on its behalf. Any questions for Tony? Tony. Yeah. Turn yourself, Tony. Oh, sorry. So, in terms of that question of, uh, you know, driving down it being a green place, is that something that you see as a potential priority? And if so, I guess, do you have any thoughts on um, what we could be doing about it? I think one of the good things about the Jensen report is it said rather than look at this area as a as whole one, there are different different responses needed by council for different localities. And so, some of the things Mr. Brookman said, I agree with. Uh, some of the things we tell the residents, I agree with as well. So the, the beauty of the Jensen report says, look, if this is not going to be primary production, what are the options? And different localities would lend to different land sizes to, to achieve overall a green outcome. I mean, if you go, for example, in Gawler Belt near Xavier College, that is the greenest that area has ever been, you know, post farming. You have more tree coverage in those areas than you have anywhere else on open farming land. So if you're looking for green tree coverage, you know, intensive farming is not the answer because all you do is get roofs and you get greenhouses and a lot of plastic, et cetera, but no trees. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Yeah, Karen, me, Karen. There you go. Oops. Oh, Tony, oh, sorry. if you turn yours off. Yep. <laughs> it's a bit of a shuffle. Thank here. you, well, Tony. You said in your letter, and you said tonight that the Jensen report would be a starting point. What do you mean by starting point? My starting point is saying that that's a basis for some discussion. What the Jensen report does, in some of its recommendations, says. If prime production is not viable, here's some, some options available to council and the landowners to consider. And there's, if you notice, there's a whole range of different zoning suggested. I can't remember if it was four or five, four, five different localities. So what Jensen report saying is that you don't actually have one response to the whole area, which I agree with. You have a whole range of responses to achieve outcomes. And that would depend, as the previous uh, question indicated, if you're looking for a certain outcome, you would modify the response in terms of uh, acreages different localities. And it's also very important to mention that you may want some a lot, lot bigger allotments, but people would want a different livestock. We should accommodate both. Mm, thank you. Any other, any other questions? 
Okay, thanks, Tony. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Adrian Shackley. Who is he? Thanks, Chair. Just um, checking, I've also down to do a presentation on behalf of Border and Drive and Heritage Association. Can I do that later? Mm. Have you got, have you got, have we been advised that that's... Yes, advised Mr. Hannaford. Is that right? Today. Yeah. Okay, I can get just to mic up, yeah. Yep. The chair through the chair. We only got one uh, email from Mr. Shackley to do a presentation today, and that was for the uh, heritage uh, group. Okay. So, are you are you speaking on behalf of the heritage gear tonight? Now. For Environment and Heritage Association. Uh, well, that did happen. I'm happy to proceed, but I, I mean, I'll do the presentation now on behalf of Border and Drive and Heritage Association, if you like. You do that, but, then, but I could, good. if I could add myself on the list just briefly at the end, that might cover it. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay. thank you. Yep. Um, and just um, briefly um, to introduce, I've got a um, qualifications in both rural science and economics, and I've spent. Uh, 25 years farming in the uh, Adelaide Plains area, including both irrigation and dry land farming and, and some horticulture. Um, I'll just say in terms of land use and farming, I mean, the system never works that small lots produce by, you know, over the system produce a lot of viable farms. The majority of farm land in all of South Australia is not managed by the people who own it. It's managed under contract, leasing, share farming, etc. right across the state. I mean, people with small land holdings do not make livings out of their holdings. They lease them out, they get contractors, they do bits themselves, whatever it is. And that's how it works. That's how I work. <clears throat> and and <laughs> Cutler and Dilly are no different to other places. And the system doesn't say you should have a viable block regardless. Um, the, and I'll say, yeah, the figures are pretty clear that across the state, the majority of landholders do not manage their farms and you know, undertake those sort of things. They get income from it, but they, that's not their sole income. Just in terms of um, what is viable as well, I mean, I don't want to harp on this too much, but there was some debate in council not too many years ago about four hectare blocks on Tiver Road. And a number of councillors who generally supported for land division in Cudler were happy to vote for four hectare lots along Tiver Road on the basis that those lots could be viable for primary production. The other um, rather odd feature of the submissions that's made is the one that's on page 372 to 375 of the attachments, which is submissions on behalf of a landholder in Evanston Gardens, I think, or area, 3.6 hectare lot and a proposal to divide it into four lots, so approximately 0.9. So that land's currently in the four hectare area. Proposal is to do, put it to 0.9 hectares. And the argument from the planning consultant is, well, that's potentially okay for rural production because there are other examples nearby of land that's about a hectare that's got viable production apparently. And uh, oddly enough, uh, I don't know what the connection is, I haven't checked, but the planning reports from Mr. David Baroni, who works for an organisation called Jensen Plus, and I'll be surprised if Jensen Plus has not got some connection to Jensen Planning Plus Design. <laughs> I say I, I just found the report very unusual in presenting this argument that, that 0.9 hectares would be viable primary production land in that area. Now, yeah, take it for what it is. The um, the issues about rural zone and open space in the 
broadly in the rural area have been issues at least since the 1970s when the metropolitan open space scheme started in the late 70s there was areas sort of gener generically sort of indicated along Dalkeith Road through the hills face zone and along the Gawla River as future open space. Now open space doesn't mean public land it doesn't mean anything in relation to the land except maintaining open space sort of visuals. So Hills Face Zone along the Gawler River and connecting the Gawler River through roughly through Dalkeith Road and Smith Road was the vision from the 1970s. And that's you know, sort of continued in a way. When Hills Face Zone works pretty well, it, there are limits on what sort of development can happen there, but broadly it's all maintained as farming type land and you know with restrictions on new housing development and that's exactly what happens in Barossa Council, Light Council, you can't put a house on a block that's less than 32 hectares. <laughs> that's, that's the reality of 30 seconds thanks. of farming in those areas and only land in those areas you have no rights to put houses on land there. Now in, in our rural zone we've got a sort of a hybrid system that allows sort of a combination of primary production, effectively rural living, and, and quite a few other uses. And it works up to a point because you know, there's big enough blocks for people to get on with each other. But it will not work when you know, small blocks are created which allow you know, interference with other activities. And just on um, public... Five service, minutes. Yes, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll deal with the rest later. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Shackley? Oh, Cody, yep. Uh, if you turn yours off, Cody, you turn yours on, yep. So, around the open space and the visuals, is that, um, if, you know, if the priority, I guess, is just the look of coming into Gola, um, doesn't, you know, does that, you know, Tony was talking about just having different areas with different different uses. Should it be that, you know, that the area that comes along a, a main road that someone might visit is greener and we allow other parts to be different? Or like what's, you know, would that would that still fit within that open space vision? Press your button. <laughs> Good to be thinking about. I mean visual stuff is important that's what hills face zone is mostly about and that's what you know the the vision for some of these areas of Gawler mm -hmm. was at that time and still is in many ways now of course you can mess that up with you know massive um you know, gla uh, plastic houses and things like that in, in quite easily so that, you know those sort of rules and, and constructions about how you do things what sort of landscaping is appropriate they're all things that need to be dealt with. Are things that were never dealt with um, when the rules were set up for both four hectare subdivision, which all occurred under Playford you know, Manapara Council decades ago, or when the 0.9 hectares issue came in in Cuddler. No other rules about how to manage it. Uh, planning's a very complicated and complex system. You need in place a whole lot of those thought processes to manage it not just land block sizes and what, you know, going down that track, you end up with a mess. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think that, has that covered it, Cody? Yep. Any other questions? Nathan? Oh, thank you, Adrian. Um, so you touched on the, the uh, sort of the status quo, the way that it is now um, allows the sizing and blocks to keep um, the ability in different activities. Or I'm not sure exactly how you said it, but how do you think Cuddler looks right now? Do you think the buffer exists right now? Are you are you happy with how it all sits as it sits now? Happy about That's it. A subjective question. Okay. Because <laughs> it's like I say, in the previous land division sort of rules and the whole of the planning process for the last 60 years hasn't considered those issues properly. All it's done is put in size in allotment minimums and 
off you go. Now, there's no guarantee in that that anyone does anything about landscaping or, or, or amenity. It's just not the, non-existent at the moment. It's an accident if it happens. So, you know, of course you get a, <laughs> a lot of blocks that aren't, aren't well looked after because people have no intention of looking after them. They're just wanting to, you know, see if they can sell them off or whatever. And other people who happy, you know, want to do things to look after their blocks. So you've got a mix of the, all those things happening. Yeah, I think that's answered the question. Yeah, um, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chuckley. Adrian? Yep. Uh, oh, no. um, okay, that's that's all the um, representations that for people that have put in submissions. We'll now go on to people that have not put in submissions but would like to be heard tonight. And the first is uh, Matt Laurie Hunter. Matt, there we go. There we go. Hi, my name is Matthew Hunter. Um, sorry, the, the name's slightly different on my email. Um, <laughs> I'm a new resident in Cudlow. Um, I live on 9,000 square metres of 0.9 hectares. Moved there uh, about three years ago. And I guess my concern is that um, in a planning perspective, my background is civil and, and structural engineering. Um, my concern is um, that the planning process has to be really well considered. We moved into the area to, to um, partake in rural living. And so we haven't built a house and then stuck a, a fence around it um, on only 800 square metres, assuming that we're going to be able to subdivide and get a good payday. We've developed the whole land. We want to live on 9,000 square metres. Now, I understand that there's other people in the area who may want to subdivide and things like that. Fair <laughs> enough. But I guess the thing is that there's a... There's not many places like Cuddler um, in the state that have the accessibility to um, city, but also rural living opportunities, and it's unique. And my concern is that if it gets subdivided down too, too low, that you lose the special nature of the area. The other thing, though, is that a lot of people might think, well, you know, if we subdivide it down to smaller blocks, or, or small, really quite small blocks, you know, I'm going to get a lot of money from the subdivision. That's not necessarily, I mean, you will be able to sell some of your land, but the thing is that developers aren't going to want to pay much more than the current cost of the land. Um, it's, it's, it's sometimes um, a bit of a, an interesting one. So my concerns are this, that it will lose the special nature of the area, um, that there's going to be cost increases. Um, who's going to pay for the development? Who's going to pay for the, up, the upgrade of roads, the upgrade of electricity, the upgrade of water, the upgrade of, of um, putting in sewers and all these sorts of things? It's going to be on the residents to pay for that at the end of the day. Um, you know, there's, and, you know, for, for someone like myself who's not interested in selling off any land, it's going to price us out of that area. Um, there's quite a few people that seem to be moving into Cuddler um, buying these um, lifestyle blocks uh, currently and building and wanting to do that. Um, and so I don't think there's, I don't think that there's just one answer. I, I disagree with Tony Piccolo that he's representing everyone's views because it doesn't represent my views necessarily. I think there's a lot of different views in the area. Um, will people like myself, if you do subdivision, be allowed to keep animals? We've got currently two alpacas on the back block that we're, which we want to keep. Um, what's going to happen with our council rates? I'll be honest, council rates are already pretty high for the, for the value of my land. If, if people subdivide, what's going to happen to the value of my land? Bum, you know, it's going to go right up. And am I going to be able to afford to live in the area any longer? No. Um, and so it might sound great, hey, let's subdivide down to 4,000 or 2,000 square metres or 1,000 square metres. The reality is that to say that people can choose whether they're going to live on the 9,000 square metres or not, it's not realistic. It, it's either going to be one thing or another. It can't be a hodgepodge because it's not going to work that way. Um, that's just the reality of it. And we've, we've developed our land to live on 9,000 square metres. We've filled up the land, we've landscaped the land. It can happen. Um, but I guess that's the thing is that the long-term planning that is, is created really determines and sets what people are going to do. Be honest with you, I'd be pretty upset if after five years of living there, um, we either get priced out 
we have to sell because the, the, um, the council rates are too much. Um, and we're just not going to get a return on what we've invested into our property currently. Um, we've put a tennis court, we've put the pool in, we've put all these things in, and we're not going to get a return, re realistically. So, um, you know, do I have a, you know, my own interest in that? Absolutely. But that's from a resident point of view. Um, I think realistically that the whole of Cuddler should be treated the same. I understand that there's a hodgepodge like north of our, like we're on Athel Road, north of Athel Road that's, you know, bigger um, lot sizes. I think there's got to be some reason, reason there, um, reasonability with that. But for me, I wouldn't want to see the area, you know, subdivided down smaller than 4,000 square metres because I think it's just going to rip the whole area apart, change it, and it's not realistic to say some people can stay on 9,000 square metres, some people can subdivide down to, you know, 1,000. That's my point. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, any questions? Yep. Mayor Karen, there we go. Yeah. Matthew, just got to turn yours off. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. There we go. Um, so, Matt, you talked about the area being unique. Firstly, how did you find out about it? And just if you can expand on the uniqueness of why you were attracted to the area, uh, just for the benefit of, of this group. Thank you. Yeah, I found out about it by fluke. We lived down in Elizabeth and um, just happened to end up driving through that area and found and, and noticed the, you know, because from Main North Road, you don't see it. Um, and we were looking to live in that kind of lifestyle. We had previously moved from rural Victoria. We liked, we don't want to farm, but we want to live in space. And so we just fell in love with the idea automatically of living in that area. The, the special nature of the area is that it is rural, um, that, you know, you don't have people all over the top of you. And also just the fact that you can keep a couple of animals, you can, you know, um, you know, you can do some of your own growing, your, your orchards, your vegetables, things like that. You can have a bit of space and you can have that sort of lifestyle block. Um, there's really not a lot of other places where you can do that without having to manage a large, you know, live in a rural area without having to manage a large amount of property. Thanks, Matt. Any other questions for Matthew? Nathan, yep. Yeah, okay, thanks, Matthew. Um, so just to confirm, I, I think I heard you right, but, um, you said that you wouldn't like anything lower than 4,000 square metres, is that correct? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's my opinion. Um, I know different people would have different opinion, but I just think, you know, two or 4,000 square metres, that kind of area. Like I just know a lot of the, the properties in that area, they are narrow frontages, long blocks. How on earth are you going to access that um, you're going to have to, developers are going to have to put big roads and all sorts of things to access those, those back areas. Um, the reality is that if you start cutting it down to really quite small block sizes, it's, it's wipe everything out, start again. Developers won't want to touch it either if they're wanting to, having to access, you know, the back of these blocks through narrow frontages, um, you know, and some people have got this and that. I mean, what developer is going to be able to make a lot of money off that because the amount of infrastructure they're going to have to put in to then get a return, I just don't think it's going to be viable for the developers either. Um, so I think it's either you keep it as a rural living kind of feel and um, you know, north of Athel Road, yeah, let them subdivide down lower, but or you just wipe the slate clean and make it 300 square metres. It's not really going to work, I don't think. Either way, it's got to be one or the other. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ian Tooley, up next. Um, thank you, Chair. Just before I start, can I just make a correction? You said that um, I didn't put in a submission. Can I just correct the record? I did. I did it. On, I did it online. Um, I used the online 
um, opportunity. I responded to the council's posts in quite a large um, submission. So it's in there in the electronic form. So I did do that. So can I begin now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to say, when I first came on council, I hadn't really paid much attention to the, the rural zone, even though I've lived here since 1980. And uh, it was when I joined the council in 2014 um, with the likes of Bev Gibbon um, that I started to pay attention and started to understand. And then I was part of many, many consultations, community consultations that this council had um, and read hundreds of submissions and reports that came back from our consultations with the rural zone. We had hundreds of them. And I think Tony Piccolo is quite right um, when he says that this council has a, a habit of acting the ones that it likes, but shoving aside the ones that it doesn't. And that's been my observation over my seven years on council, particularly around um, the rural zone. I was told that Jensen two can't be released because it's too confidential. And I was told that if we did release it, um, it would cause a land rush. I fought and fought and eventually I was the council that got Jensen two released. And as you can see, uh, Jen, there has not been a land rush. The, the world hasn't fallen apart. Um, all the things we were told that it shouldn't be released or the reasons haven't borne out. And Jensen two um, is a really good starting point. It does talk about different ways of looking at the rural zone. It was me also as a councillor that got us to the point where we had the submission ready to go to the minister to rezone the area. And then three years ago, this council said, we wanna put that on hold. And they said that's because there's a new planning um, law coming out. Well, isn't it interesting that what the minister now wants and what you're saying the minister wants is exactly what the minister wanted three years ago. So what this council did again was to filibuster. We lost another three years before we started again. And this latest report from Mr. Kelly is the beginning of trying to gather that data. But we could have been doing that three years ago, but this is the pattern, sadly, of the council. Look what's happening all around us. If you look about Land Creek, when they did Elizabeth, named after the recent monarch that's just passed, that was prime farming land. There was an outrage about that. As Adelaide grew and it came over the areas of um, primary production and of um, intense production, residential areas creeped in. Look around us right now. Aspire, Orleana Waters, Springwood. Look what's happening along the Northern Expressway. All the uplift because it's flat land along a major corridor. Look what's happening between us and Roseworthy. I haven't heard any of you complain about Concordia other than you want to grab it as council land, but Concordia, and this is, if I speak to Mr. Hunter's point about how this works, um, the land owners, a group has come together and spoken to them and has got them to commit to a master plan. And that is how developers do it. They don't work with just individuals. They talk to a number of landowners to get a large enough um, amount of land to make it viable. That's what would happen in our rural zone down here as well. That's going to happen at Concordia. You accept that. Uh, it's prime production land right now. But you don't, I haven't heard one of you complaining. You just want to grab it from the Barossa Valley. So it's happening around you, but you're not consistent with your barriers. And yet you've had an absolute barrier to the voices from the people from the rural zone. So <laughs> What did Mr. Kelly's report tell us? It told us what we already knew. Most land is below five hectares. There's not viable water supply. And I love the quote from Mr. Kelly. He said that the land is capable of primary production, but not suitable for primary production. When we've consulted with the landowners, they've said to us every time the same things, no water, primary production is not viable. 30 seconds, Mr. Tommy. But what they do want, and we got them to divine it, they don't want to go down to 400 square metres. The majority of them told us in their submissions, they want something like a minimum of 2,000 square metres. 
That's what everyone seems to agree on. We also agree that we, everyone seems to agree, we want the area to be greened up. We want it to be a nice transition from the intensive residential of the South. We want a nice lead into the town. I've reminded this council several times that we have that on our Eastern boundary, where we've come in from, um, oh, past Sunnydale. Tell me. <clears throat> if you could just be gracious, some speakers have had seven minutes, if I could just have a, a little bit more. Um, a minute, Mr. Tillman, thank you. Sorry? A minute, Mr. Tillman. Um, we have Hamilton Estate where mm. Paul Kosh lives. Um, it's a half acre. Mr. Mr. Twilley, I don't think you need to um, reference where I live. Thank you. Um, Hamilton Estate, where a number of the councils in this room live, um, it's a lovely half acre. It's very, very green, and it gives a lovely transition in. If we do nothing with this area and we let it fester, the state government will do what it's done in many other areas and we will lose that ability to have the transition. If they take over and say, we're gonna rezone it without us intervening, we could have dense urban infill down to two, down to three to 400 square meters. Six minutes, Mr. Turley. So if we could, it's just 30 seconds more, Mr. Gosh, if I could please. If, if we do something as a council and we listen to the people of the rural zone and we rezone it to something like half acre, 2000 square meters, we will protect it from the state government putting dense <coughs> urban, we will green it up and we'll turn it into something that's a beautiful transition and something that's viable. That is what the people have said for decades. Please listen to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Tully? Actually, I've got one question for Mr. Turley. I, I just wanted to clarify, um, did I hear you correctly to say that Cuddler would be master planned? Thank you for asking that. Now, what I was trying to clarify is, um, Mr. Hunter and others have said, but what if you know one person's got a small block and that can't be developed? I was explaining that the way it works, and we've seen this around Anglevale, and we've seen it with the way the lands come together at Cudler, uh, sorry, at um, Concordia, is that typically um, developers talk to landowners and they'll get an en masse grouping, which is then big enough to be viable to pay for um, the roads, the sewage. So it tends to be, if you like, they're a bit of a property whisperer and they speak to a number of them. They don't do it individually. And I think like this gentleman here is acting on behalf of um, a client. You will, you will also get these developers will do that. Uh, Mr. Brown, Damien Brown has done that for the whole of the Concordia area. So that's what I was trying to explain that that might be how it works. Thank you. Actually, just to clarify, just through the planners, how many landowners are there in Cadillac? Roughly. Uh, through the chair, there's about uh, 400 property owners in the rural zone. Okay. So, so for a master plan to go ahead, the developer would need to get a consensus with a majority of 400 landowners? That would be if you included Cudler, okay. right Helia, yeah, yeah. Biberinga, yeah. all those it, places. It probably, it probably works okay when there's one or two farmers owning large acreages, essentially. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you. What point? Of the point that you need this 400 people, 400 landowners. Yeah, could I? Um, if you look at what's happened out at Angle Vale, um, Two Wells, Virginia, um, it's been a case of three, four, or five of the neighbouring landowners that developers spoken to, and you'll see those clusters of development within the space. They didn't need to get all of them to do it. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. Um, now, have we got um, any other people that want to speak? There was one person that stood up that wanted to speak. Do they want to speak now? When Mr. Kelly was speaking, he's coming. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. Could you just press the button, please, sir? And your, your name, sir? Yep, thank you. Nine years, <clears throat> bought the land as deferred residential. 1988, 
uh, got a development plan amendment, changes to rural. Since then, we haven't had one ounce of market gardening. We've been coming here listening to, yeah, we need water, we're working on water. Well, that's been going on 15 years. The water underground, uh, 5,700 parts per million of salt. No good, 60 grand to drill it. You've got to get the EPA involved to get rid of the salt. It's not viable for market gardening. We're not allowed greenhouses, no uh, tunnels. So you're basically down to uh, wheat farming or whatever. What are you gonna do on four and five acre you know, properties? You can't make any money out of it. So uh, we just want this to move ahead. It's been going on for way too long. We were severely disadvantaged 39 or back since 1988 and nothing's happened since. So uh, it, it, as far as it's just a stonewalling tactic, it's development control. Uh, and I've been listening to the same story from council. Yeah, uh, we want to maintain views of the hills and uh, the surrounding area. The views are already taken. There's car yards, there's cement works, there's all sorts there. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. There's no one growing in in our area. Thank you. Any questions? No, okay, thank you. Uh, I think Mr Shackley, you want to speak again as someone on the night, <laughs> not from gear, but from the night. Yeah, thank you. Just a couple, couple yep. of minutes. Yep. Um, just briefly, in terms of um, consultation, I reckon the worst example of consultation relating to Cuddler was when Point Nine came in about 20 years ago. Nobody knew about that until it suddenly appeared as a proposal after all public consultation had ceased in relation to what happened in the rural zone. I don't think we've ever had an explanation as to why that happened, but I'm just <coughs> making that point. I'd also like to say that uh, as a person who's been actively involved for the last 23 years growing native plants in a local community nursery, that quite a few people from uh, Hillier, Cuddler, um, Evanston Park, Evanston uh, South area have been people who've come and looked for plants who've been keen to uh, you know, do some revegetation around the area with blocks of you know, quite significant blocks of land, some of them. And uh, funnily enough, I don't know that I've seen any of those people turn up at these public meetings. They seem to be quiet people who are just getting on with living on their blocks and uh, uh, you know, looking after their blocks. In relation to Greenbelt, there's been a constant sort of issue with that over the years. Um, in fact, I was involved in organising a workshop in 1982 at the old TAFE about Greenbelt. And we've had the problem the whole way through. People think Greenbelt is a lot of trees. You know, it could be, but really properly in that area, it's original native grassland all through that Cuddler, Hillier, Evanston South area, very few trees at all in that area. So if you're changing, you know, planting a lot of trees, I know that people shouldn't plant trees, but keeping land that's productive and low uh, profile is much more consistent with the ecological history of that area. And you know, that's all set out in the, in the um, council's biodiversity plan, the history of that that land. And indeed, that's what happens when a lot of these blocks that are just left and slashed, there's hectares and hectares out there now of native grassland that sort of you know, come back in various forms. It's a fascinating story that's not really that well understood. But in terms of, um, you know, heat sinks and uh, climate change and you know, temperatures and things, low level grassy ecosystems can be just as effective, if not more effective than trees in, in looking after the environment. If you just plant trees, I mean, have a look along Main North Road where the state government planted trees about 30 or 40 years ago. It's a desert underneath. It's just mostly bare ground with the odd weed. So that doesn't help with climate change much at all. It creates some shade, but it creates a whole lot of other issues that means that it's very ineffective, apart from the issue of that it blocked all, everybody's view from, from the roads. I mean, it was a really odd sort of activity to have undertaken. Council in the rural zone also needs to be thinking about what's happening along Gawler River. I mean, about, 
1986, I reckon, there was a plan put in the state planning system, said there should be an open space corridor along the Gawler River between Gawler and the coast. And it was written into the 2036 state plan uh, quite a few years ago, should achieve it, achieve it by, nine, by 2036. Well, I'll tell you what, we need to get on with it because Gawler Council's actually done a bit and Playford's done a bit, but um, there's a long way to go to create that sort of area. And that's an issue because that's what's in our, part of that land is all in our rural zone. And it hasn't really been looked at as to how to achieve that. Uh, you know, so that's why I say, this is all pretty complex stuff. In terms of how to deal with <laughs> development in an area like Cuddler and Hillier, you know, that, we've had two or three schemes over the years that came up with, you know, developers get people together, all sort of, you know, divvy up lots and come to a, an arrangement where you could have development rights transferable and into, you know, some urban development and then maintain most the area of open space. Well, the complexity of it seems to have defeated all of them, you know, probably unfortunately, because there's some potential there to, to do that sort of scheme, but you would have to do the homework and get it right. Otherwise, you know, it 30, doesn't 30 seconds, Adrian. No, no, I'm, that's it, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, any questions for Adrian? Any more on, on what he's just spoken about? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, last call, anybody else? Yep, come up. <laughs> And Vince so, Maiola is my name. Pardon? Vince, Vince Maiola is my name. Yep. Thank you. I was born in Gawler 66 years ago. Went to Gawler High. Lived on Hilly Road all my life. A little bit nervous right now, but I'll probably get over it when my time's up. I've sat here listening to people ramble, ramble, ramble. It's so sad, this last little bit Mr Shackley just said about people have come to Cuddler and tried to get people in. That what pe developers have forgotten about Gawler. The big developers are developing at two wells, Virginia, Roseworthy, because this council is too hard, too negative, and doesn't understand. Councils are great, but the trouble is council forget they work for the people, not for their own self. Out here, we've got the best water. Like I I've been listening to the water. We've got the best underground water in Hillier, Emerson Gardens, and everywhere else, but you can't afford to buy it. Understand that. They've changed the way the, the water system is a, is a funny system because the mines department, you can't take water from here, take it there, take it there, take it there, because they're controlling the water basin. But to say that the water's no good here, that's bullshit. To say that the Language, land's... Please. That, yep. I apologise. Yep. To say the land's no good, to say the land's no good, I, I, I think we've got the worst land in this area, Hillier, and I've worked market gardens. I've worked market gardens in Virginia, Gawler River, and I've, I've seen land at Penfield. That's beautiful land. The land we've got here has got a, a, sub, a subsoil and then it's clay. It's good to grow capsicums, potatoes, and all this, no, no potatoes, because for potatoes, onions, and stuff like that, you've got to have free soil for harvesting and stuff like this. It makes me angry, so angry. I went to a meeting when Mr. Samble was mayor, when they had a meeting and they talked about Gawler's rah, 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 to do all these things. Gawler's got nothing except land. Start developing the land you've got. Start with Cuddler, start with Emerson Gardens, start with Hillier. Forget about this, this Dixie stuff you're thinking about of growing, living, living in the forests. We don't live in the forest. We, we, today, the world's changed. We've got everything there. We've got row along, we've got gas, we've got everything there. Sewers is all there. We continue, to, continue from Elizabeth. That's supposed to be not this stuff they're doing now. They're going out to Roseworthy. They go out to Two Wells. They're going out this way. They built a highway at the back of Gawler, spent all that money and forgot about this area here. You could have been making money from rates and taxes here and still had that road going to the back. But no, you've closed your, you've closed your mind. You've, you've put blinkers on and you won't see outside of it. I, I had a meeting with Ms. Redmond and, and the, the boss here, whatever his name is, I can't think of his name right now. 
I had a meeting with them and they sat back in their chair. The boss said, oh, what if I told you we've got 30 years land? And I asked him the question, where's the 30 years land? Is it in Gawala? All you want, all you're thinking about is grabbing land from another council. Develop what you got. You've got gold here. Do your mind, mind, mind what you've got, not run, run, running around trying to steal other people's. They've had the, the, the vision to do things that they've had the, 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 the good, they've had all this, to, and now you want to go take that. How's that work? You want to steal someone else's ideas? You've got your own, you've got your own land here. Do what you've got to do. People want to come into the area, beautiful. But guess what? Why this one person that's come into the area has got to make it hard for the people that have been living here all their lives and they want to cash in on what they got? Is it about money? Yep, 90% is about money, but it's reality. It's what it is. It's what it is. People can't afford the water cost. People say, bring the, the and we had this Nick, I can't think of his last name right now because I'm confused in the head, but we had Nick come here and talk about the water. The water quality, the, the, um, the stuff that they do at Bolivar, it's no good for the ground. There's too much salt in it. They're taking, and, they, and this has nothing to do with us. I better not go there. 30 but, seconds, thanks. Yeah, that's enough. I'll talk about okay. <laughs> any questions? Yes, any questions? Anybody <laughs> like to question me? Ask, <laughs> answer me a question. <laughs> Yes, uh, any questions? No, thank you. <laughs> We're right, thank you very much. Okay, that, uh, that last call, anybody else? No, okay, thank you. That ends the public submissions, public presentations. Okay, let's go back to our agenda, please. Any, okay, we've heard the um, presentations. Any, Cody, you wanna start? In the, Yeah, look, I'm happy to move the motion, just uh, pointing out that this is, um, this is all just noting, noting what's happening. We don't actually have the power to make decisions right now because we're in caretaker mode as a council for the upcoming elections. So, um, but I think this is working towards um, something that I think people have been, have been trying to get to for a while. Um, I do thank everyone for coming along um, and participating. Um, this is something that, look, it's been happening for a long time. Um, I keep hearing about, you know, meetings that happened in 1982 or whatever, and I wasn't born yet. So, uh, you know, I definitely wasn't in those discussions. Um, but coming into here on my first term on council, I'm sort of been working through the reports, um, going through the feedback, <coughs> asking questions. Um, and it's, yeah, it's quite interesting. I think everyone has a broad range of views on what exactly, what exactly they want, but I think what most people seem to agree on is that it's been a long time and that council's been dragging its feet for a very long time. So, um, and I agree that I think we need to, you know, make decisions. Um, and I think things like the report that we just got are a really important step towards that. And yeah, um, the consultations came up a couple of times and I definitely understand the frustrations around that. Um, it's, you know, because it is something that I've been trying to figure out how we can improve our consultation process. We do get a lot of technical reports or big reports and then council sends out submissions for something like the budget because we want community feedback on the budget, which is the most important document of the year. But, you know, before I was on council, I certainly wouldn't have gone through several hundred pages of financial reports so that I could, you know, so that I, I could contribute. So the people who do send in their submissions, um, I definitely thank you for that because um, I am I am listening. I do read them, um, but uh, yeah, it's just uh, a lot of a lot of technical um, advice going on that I'm not a farmer, so. Um, I'm just working with what we have. I hope we can get to a common sense decision and that it can go um, to, yes, our new Minister for Planning, Nick Champion, to continue the process. Thank you. And have we got a seconder for this motion? Di, you want to speak to it? Thank you. Um, thank you everybody for coming along <clears throat> again. Um, this is a very, such a complex 
um, issue, and it has been for a number of years. Um, first of all, I'm not a farmer, but I, over the years, I've probably come to the conclusion that the land isn't isn't um, the land hasn't been um, farmed for a long time. It's going to be very difficult and expensive to bring it back, to, and it's not big enough for primary production. So I do understand that. Um, and another thing is. Um, I've also gathered over the years that one size doesn't fit all. Some people want to stay as they are, some want to downsize. Um, so I don't know how we cope with that because um, Mr Hunter's right, if they, if they downsize and you've got a bigger plot, well then your rates are going to go up. So that's, you know, it is, it is a really difficult situation like that. Um, public expectation of Cuddler especially Cuddler. Um, I think the majority of people in Gawler would agree that, albeit that they don't want it to be, to join Elizabeth, they probably don't know, don't think that it's got the greatest um, welcoming to, to Gawler that it could have. Um, and that's probably because of um, lack of trees and things like that. But then as Mr Shackley said, the land wasn't originally full of trees. So, you know, that, that becomes another problem. Um, roof, I don't think anybody wants to see roof to roof housing there. I don't think that any, well, nobody that I've spoken to wants to see roof to roof housing at all. Um, and um, as far as when they're talking about Concordia, being approved and we didn't object to it it wasn't it's not our land it wasn't our land and that was uh, Mr Holloway that did that he approved that like he approved Springwood so um and we didn't have any say in that so you know if um that wasn't anything to do with us so um I don't, you know, as I said, it's it's such a complex situation, but this is just a noting report and I'm happy, happy to second it. Okay, I'll open it up for discussion. Anyone like to speak before or against this motion? Ah, oh, Nathan, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, look, I like um, my colleague Cody Davies. Um, I wasn't wasn't born when that conversation started, um, but look, I'm learning a lot uh, coming into my first term. Um, I completely agree with the sentiment about community consultation. Um, I think sometimes it's overcomplicated, uh, and we can't net the actual answers that we're looking to net. So I think there's some work to be done um, to be done in that space. Um, I look at the um, consultant's report, which I think this is about the third time um, Jim Kelly has presented um, to this chamber. Um, and I look at the consultant's report as one that errs on the side of caution. It doesn't rule out every single possibility, but it quite clearly says that it's not really practical to do um, the primary production side. Um, so, yeah, I... I just wanted to make that point that, um, you know, I don't necessarily think the consultant's report is saying, look, I reckon we should be able to do this. I think it highlights um, a possibility, but it's a very slim possibility. And I think um, that's a point that we really need to make. Um, the other point I think to make is, is this area, to me, as soon as I started um, hearing from the residents of the area and going out and visiting myself, it became pretty evident pretty quickly that there is a handbrake that has been put on um, parts of these areas and then other areas that handbrake's off. That doesn't make any sense to me um, as a resident of Gaul that's proud of my town. Um, I want to be able to see um, our, I want to be proud of every area that we, we have in our 42 square kilometres and handbrakes in areas take away that ability to be able to be proud of those areas. I like hearing the stories that someone's come in and, and developed 9,000 square metres. I reckon that's fantastic, um, but it's not the norm. And I'd really like to see some activation in the space. What does that look like? That I'm not sure yet, um, but we do have a strong voice in this community and it is time we start listening to it and trying to tease out what the majority of our community actually wants on a factual level and start working through that. I don't 
disagree that there isn't uh, there is a one size fits all sort of model. I I don't think there is a one size fits all, but um, we owe it to the community of this area and the greater community um, to really unpack it all um, because I think it's pretty definitive that any other options have been ruled out now. So yeah, looking forward to continuing the conversation and I'm happy to support this. Thanks, mate. David, you wanna? Yeah, um, I, I think you know, all of us councillors want the best development for our town. Um, I, I do actually have qualifications in agriculture production, agricultural business. And I've actually worked with local farmers for 35 years and had small uh, business experience and uh, also been on the development assessment panel for across the council for seven years as deputy chair. I was on the Mid-Murray development. Uh, so got experience with, with uh, how, how those councils work and their rural zones as well. Um, my first job after leaving Rosewelly Agricultural College was at a local rose nursery, which is still going. And at, at the time, they had 18 staff. It's, it's still working. I don't know if they've still got 18 staff, but that rose nursery is only on a, a small number of hectares. It's only about two hectares. It's a small, small place. But I think it's really important that we continue to support these businesses. They've been operating for a very long time. They don't have high profit margins, as has been said, but they do employ a large number of school leavers especially and and people in our community need jobs and especially that first job is really important and I, I think that's that's something that you know, hasn't been said before uh, my family actually ran a market garden at Glind and was basically pushed out by residential development uh, we had three boards on our property uh, at Glind um, so I know what happens there uh, we grew flowers and greenery and that was quite viable and um, I think you know, you know, it's been said, but um, water in you know, our rural zone is an important issue. Um, it needs to be addressed. It's, it's an important issue also in Eden Valley. There's no water in Eden Valley. So they're looking at putting a pipeline through to Eden Valley at the moment. Um, you know, is there a way of tapping into that? There could be. So it's, it's not a pop. So it's not really a pipe dream. It is something that is required in, you know, in parts of our uh, near area. I think most of the residents in Gawler, uh, as, as, as well as you know, the landowners in Cutler, should have a say in its future. And I, I think a large number of uh, the residents of Gawler want some sort of rural zone, open space area, which I think is really important to the residents of Gawler. Um, and you know, there are those open spaces that, that have the native grasslands. Um, you know, we do have that transport uh, system you know, with, with the train station at Cutler, which which could be developed as well. Um, I think rural housing, our rural land needs to be saved from housing. Um, and there are jobs for our community in the rural zone. There's also, of course, the important thing of food, which is really important for us to actually survive. And that whole rural character is important for the, the Gaul residents, as I've said before. Um, so we're talking about large rural living areas, really, which where people can have uh, animals, um, um, horses, grow vegetables, flowers, and, and you know, some of these things are economically viable uh, in a rural living area. I would be really concerned if, if we went down to 2,000 square metres because that's actually just a, a large residential block. Um, and you know, we would have a lot of is issues because we'd actually have a new population the size of Lindock in our Cudler rural, rural zone. And what inf infrastructure, you know, so we, we as ratepayers and council would have to supply would be huge. Um, I think we represent all of Gawler as councillors, so we have to be very careful of that. And uh, we've had uh, the economic reports of Jensen, Kelly, Perza, all actually highlighting the production from that rural zone, um, you know, talking you know, $10 million or more dollars, um, you know, which is important. And you know, as I've said, uh, you know, there are, Locals that um, you know, that that's their livelihood, um, that's their jobs, and um, it is part of Gawler's character that we have to be very careful with in how we set the future uh, for our town and our area. And you know, it, it, it's I don't believe as a council we have been dragging our feet on this. Um, we've actually tried to do everything. 
Um, you, you, you can disagree and uh, you can laugh if you like, uh, but uh, um, it, it has actually been Keys, the state Councilor government. Keys, it, it is Keys. the state government uh, that's Keys. been pushing this. Just, uh, yep, yep. It, it is the state government that's been pushing uh, the way that council, call the uh, council, has to approach this. 30, 30 it's not, seconds, Councillor Hughes. Yep. Thank you. It's it's not uh, it's not the call the council. It's actually the state government that's been actually asking for these uh, these different bits and pieces of, and we've been providing it, and um, they haven't been in position to do anything more than that. But. Uh, uh, I do think the rural zone for all of Gawla is, is important for, for all of Gawla's future and the uh, majority of Gawla residents you know, want the open spaces. So we have to do this very carefully. Thanks, Councillor Hughes. Mayor Redman. Okay. Personally, thank you to everyone who's spoken this evening. Um, I'll just take up a point that Mr Piccolo talked about that uh, people want the state government to do a ministerial DPA. We've had two of those, one in Springwood by Minister Holloway, I think Councillor Fraser mentioned that, and of course the race course and Gawler and District College is still, is still suffering as a result of that terrible DPA with no structure planning. Sp Springwood, Gawler East had no structure planning apart from a 1,000 lot trigger for a road. It was poor planning. It was it was terribly done, um, and it didn't take into account the views of residents. Um, this is a really complex area. I, I don't think that's understating it at all. Many different views have been heard tonight, and I really appreciate, I think everyone around the table really appreciates those views. Uh, so it is, it is going to be a challenge. Uh, the Jensen 2 report is a, is a good report, but so is Mr Kelly's report tonight. Um, and I think many people acknowledged the quality of those, those reports. So I'd like to think that we could work through this area and hopefully address some of the issues. You, sometimes you, you can never please everybody. Uh, so um, I'll leave that there. But I think a ministerial DPA, Gawler has not done well out of those ministerial DPAs. It was poor planning. It was how not to do um, a rezoning up in Gawler East. Um, it, it, it is proving very challenging. We have a fabulous developer up there now who's going gangbusters. And I think um, they will be very, very successful. We have many developers in the town uh, many who work very effectively with council staff, and there are some developers who acknowledge the professionalism of um, council staff. So there are different views, of course, uh, and I really like hearing different views. I'm sure everybody agrees. Uh, so I'll leave it there, Chair, uh, um, uh, but I support this motion. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Okay, I'll just like to, I'll just just want to again thank everybody for their uh, presentations tonight. Um, it's important that everybody was given an opportunity to be heard tonight. Um, just so on that note, I'll um, I'll uh, put this motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Okay, carried unanimously. Thank you. That's it for that one. Do you want a short break, everybody? Yeah, we might just have a, a five minute break. It's been quite a um, Intensive session. Thank you.
Uh, okay, everybody, can we just get back and we'll finish off this um, this meeting? Councillors, thank you. <laughs> Should have been supper <laughs> Okay, everybody. Okay, back back on deck. Okay, we're on page yeah, eleven of eighteen. Oh, me? Yeah, you want to? I'm happy to move the officer's recommendation of five point two. Uh, any second? Uh, okay. Yep. Do you want to speak to it? Me? No. Yeah, do you want to speak to it? No. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. I'll put that. All those in favour. That's pretty quick. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, 5.3, 306 Twaits Road, Gawla Belt Code Amendment. Anybody? Which I've got some questions about this, but uh, yeah, okay. Mayor Redmond, you want to open up? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris Hannaford and staff for the uh, report. Uh, I've got a question around stormwater. Uh, it's well acknowledged that the Gawler Belt area has a significant problem with uh, stormwater drainage, and I don't see that adequately addressed in our submission. I know that um, yeah, we're a, a, an adjoining council area, so there's probably a limit to what we can uh, comment on. However, I think we could have been a little bit stronger in some of our comments around uh, just some of the questions around how they're going to manage um, uh, their stormwater management. So just, just a question to staff around stormwater. Thank you. Yep. 
Thank you, through the chair. Um, there are stormwater issues um, in this uh, area and the development of another 29 uh, hectares will add to that. Um, what we have said in the actual uh, submission that we're proposing to provide to uh, Holmes Dyer, and that will also go on to uh, Light Regional Council regarding Roseworthy, is that uh, the infrastructure agreements should be in place. They weren't in place in the first instance. And the report saying the proponent commits to entering into those infrastructure agreements uh, pertaining to transport, stormwater and social infrastructure. There's also um, concern regarding the flow off further away and uh, from the actual site towards the Gawler boundary. And uh, that's uh, about at some points 1.5 to 1.7 kilometres from uh, Gawler's boundary. However, the report that we jointly commissioned with Light Regional Council actually, um, I think it's the Gawler and Surround Stormwater Management Plan, which the Council saw just uh, a few weeks ago, that plan actually has some mitigation measures in there and we're actually highlighting that those mitigation measures need to be um, implemented. So we could, we had a discussion with uh, Andrew Goodsell about that, we could um, lodge the submission, which is not critical, but it's, it's saying that there is, uh, there are stormwater issues and uh, in the area adjacent to um, Gawler, but what we could do is emphasize that in a letter that we would attach to the report, because the report is actually simply looking at existing reports. Some of those reports that we participated in and we paid, um, put money towards. So yeah, one solution is to actually accept the report, but highlight uh, in the letter to Holmes Dyer and which Light Regional Council will also see that uh, we are concerned about stormwater as a, as a major issue relating to this particular code amendment. Thank you, thanks. That answer your question? Okay, David, you've got a question? Yeah, you need to change oh, off, Chris. It's sorry, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really important that we uh, attach that letter. Um, I've got the same concern because the water table is really high as well. Um, there were previous plans of actually putting uh, a pipeline across the Sturt Highway um, and getting water down to the North Para and even putting extra dams in. Um, so that whole industrial area, um, you know, they do have some wetlands and water detention areas, but the actual water table is actually quite high. It's, 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 it's really uh, concerning. So I, th I think we do. Um, my, my sort of question is, um, could Gawler Council have to pay for some of this in infrastructure in the future um, with, with uh, um, you know, the, the, the stormwater and water table issues because you know, no engineer, major engineering works have actually been undertaken by anyone else. You know, is that a future uh, likelihood? Somebody like to respond to that? Yeah. Oh, we're just going to make an amendment just to take into what was just been said. Okay. Okay. Okay, we change that. Yeah. But essentially that's the Yeah, we'll, we'll sort yeah, 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 yeah. Letter. Okay. Point five. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay. Okay. 
No, we would just be adding the let them. Yep. Right. That's fine. All right. Okay. But getting back to David's question, will we have to pay some of the infrastructure costs? Is that the question? Does somebody like to have a bit of a go at that? Uh, through the chair. The Gawler Australian Stormwater Management Plan, which we've participated in, doesn't identify any additional costs that we would have to um, pay. But down the track, climate change, et cetera, who knows what the issues are, but they are further enough from our council boundary for us not to be overly concerned. And we did actually get a consultant who works for us one day a week to look at this whole issue because um, there are large uh, pondings of water immediately north and um, it does look concerning on a map. Uh, so as long as we can get the appropriate uh, flood mitigation measures in place in light regional council, we won't have to do anything. Yeah, good. <laughs> yep. uh, any other questions? <laughs> Let's sort of... <laughs> yeah, provide that, uh, yep. Any other questions? Actually, I've got a couple. Um, on page 15 of the agenda, it talks about uh, ultimately the wider Roseworthy community will rely heavily on services provided in the town of Gawler. Could you comment about that? Because that's uh, something that's been um, ongoing, I think. Through the chair, the advantage that we're looking at from the whole Roseworthy development and the Concordia development is that things will go or people will develop their housing there, but they will do their higher order shopping. Um, they'll come to Gawler for medical appointments. So we will be more than perhaps more than even a district centre, we'll, we can work towards being a regional centre and that those, uh, that Gawler Township will actually benefit from, from those new growth areas. So that's what we're referring to, that it's, it's not all a negative that these uh, places are being developed. There's a, there's a, a real silver lining to it. I suppose from my experience, um, when we have developments, we always have traffic interventions. And uh, I'm just concerned, you know, if we're going to be providing those services to those communities, you know, what are the infrastructure costs to us down the track? Because there will be, other than, you know, some benefits, say, for businesses, there was mo will most likely be infrastructure costs to our council. So are we going to look into that or should we be talking to someone about we are going to be a regional centre? Do we need, you know, extra support somehow? Through the chair, I think um, Henry, uh, the chief executive officer, and uh, Andrew uh, Goodsell will be working up some growth area strategies and look at how we, what kind of infrastructure is required, and how we can benefit both the businesses and the town. Yeah, I've, I've got some other questions before you die. Um, on page. 450 or 471 in attachment five, it talks about uh, the yield, uh, key messages, and it talks about 35 to 75 dwellings per hectare. Um, that's a lot of, uh, that's, that's a lot of houses, that's a lot of dwellings on a, a yield, you know, is that, is that down to 133 square metres per allotment? <laughs> Just like 30, sorry, it's 35 to 75 dwellings a hectare. Yeah, dwellings per hectare. Yeah, that, that is uh, more dense than you would usually get. You're looking at generally in Onkapringa about 14, 15 yeah. dwellings a hectare. Yeah. And then it goes on to having um, buildings up to a height of three levels. Is this out of character with, the, with that zone? I mean, it's a rural type zone. I mean, that would be more, you know, in, in, in a city, I would have thought, because I don't think that's, I don't think it's called it medium density or something. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's a high rise development. <laughs> yeah. We got to comment we comment about that because it seems like a high rise development out there to me. <laughs> it, it it depends entirely how how it's positioned within the uh, structure plan. Hmm. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Di, you've got some questions. <laughs> Oh, and uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. There, yeah, there, yeah, Don. Okay. My biggest concern with all this stuff at Roseworthy, oh, two reasons. One, one because it's prime, prime farming land, but the other one is we might get the people come in here and shop, but they'll be building shopping centres there eventually. Maybe in, you know, like Springwood, it took them ten years to do it, but they still will do it. But my biggest concern is the train. They will, they will travel to. Adelaide, they will drive into Gawler, they'll park their car in Gawler all day and catch the train. So we're not going to, you know, they're going, to, we're going to have to supply car parking. More car parks. And that is car. my biggest concern about the bottleneck of no car parks because they've all caught the train to go to Adelaide. Yep. Yep. Any comments about that? <laughs> That's that infrastructure needs that we, you know, transport infrastructure needs what I was talking about. Any other comments? Okay, what do you, where, do you want to move that? Yep. Have you second it, Mayor? Cody, do you want to talk to it? Okay. Mayor, do you want to talk to it? Anybody else want to talk to it? No. <laughs> okay. All right, giving everyone an opportunity when it's moved. <laughs> okay, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, that probably does, that deals with all our items. I'll just go back up to the top again. Uh, let me have a look. Oh, close. <laughs> no other questions we've had. Everyone's happy? Yeah, that's right. That's, I just, that, that's why I checked the agenda because it was, yeah. That's why I went back to the agenda. Yep. No worries. <laughs> oh. Oh. Thank <laughs> you. 